Thank you. Welcome, everybody. It is January 19th, 2023. So happy new year to everyone. Uh, if you're watching a recording of this webinar, some of the information might be out of date. So please be sure to log on to uh, yimmunize.org or cdc.gov for the most up-to-date information. Uh, we hope that everyone in Northern Arizona is dug out. We know you got a ton of snow. I think flag got like 18 inches of snow. Um, jealous of how pretty it is as we sit here, as I sit here in Phoenix, not jealous of all the work um, that it takes to live somewhere where it's really snowy, but hopefully everybody stayed safe and enjoyed your um, kids being home from school yesterday. So um, we are, we're going to do a little bit of a different kind of a spin today. We're going to talk about some general public health updates. Uh, the triple demic, as we've uh, come to know it, flu, RSV, and COVID, which you're seeing in your offices, hopefully a little less than you were seeing before uh, the new year. You know, in November and December, rates were a little bit higher for all those diseases. Uh, so hopefully it's gotten a little bit better for you. Uh, but we're going to talk a little bit about that. We are going to talk a little bit about COVID um, vaccine. We just review things about baby boosters and just in general getting kids uh, vaccinated, talk a little bit about single dose COVID vaccines, which are now available for you to order on ACES. Um, and then we're going to talk about with ADHS is here. Um, Eileen and Rose are both here from ADHS to talk about how to run reports for your cloud awards. So a little bit of a different agenda. Um, and the other thing that's different is Dr. Nick Stab, who's our, our medical epidemiologist who's been talking about all of our data is actually rounding at the children's hospital today. So uh, he's seeing little patients. So we have his friend and yours, uh, Macrina, to go over the doctors, the normal Dr. Stab kind of update. So we're sure you'll do great, Macrina. You know all these diseases too, right? I do. And thanks Dr. Nick Stab for doing the slides for me. Yes. <laughs> yes. 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 Fine. So if anything, well, and, La and Laura for making them look so beautiful. And yes. I'm almost getting hypnotized by the snow. <laughs> well, why don't you talk with us a little bit about data? Um, and feel free if you guys have questions or you want to like hear about diseases or share about yours with these uh, triple demic diseases, chat it or just unmute yourself. But let's have you start with. Uh, one of our favorite diseases that we have loved for a long time now, flu. Yes, somebody said today to me, oh, we're still talking about COVID. And I'm like, we've been talking about flu since 1918. So um, I, I think we're going to be talking about COVID for a while too. Mm -hmm. So what this shows is I know that there was a lot of um, excitement going on um, in November, December because of flu. And because in Arizona, normally we see flu cases peak much later in the year. So in November and December, our hospital systems, our docs offices and public health are actually preparing for the onslaught of flu cases in January, February, and sometimes as late as March. But this year, our flu season was much earlier. Um, it looks like it peaked in November, um, late November, early December, and it does look like its cases are going down. We're still in widespread transmission but we're in a much better place today than we were um, six weeks ago. Yeah, and so that dotted line there, for those of you who can't see this small print, the dotted line on this graph on the left here is the five, five seasons, so five-year kind of average for that week. Um, so you'll see when it was crazy, and, th and this won't surprise you since they were showing up in your office, when it was crazy, it was really crazy. Like it was not just because of the time of year, that we were seeing flu, like we don't normally see it that early here in Arizona, but also just the case counts were, I mean, the situation in the hospitals was pretty darn dire. So with flu, mm -hmm. virus being COVID. So right. um, hopefully we are through that. Um, but even though it feels better, we are still widespread. We're and still widespread. So yeah. Yep. So actually, if people come in, if, if kiddos are coming in, make sure you still provide offer that flu vaccine. Yep. Um, RSV was also another one that hit much earlier this um, year than it has in the past. 
And again, it typically impacts our kiddos, um, our babies and our kiddos under five. And as you can see by the numbers, it did impact those kiddos again. Um, and then our 65 plus um, population again is, is impacted. Um, and again, these numbers for both flu and RSV, remember that these are only lab confirmed cases, which means that these are folks who either went to their physician's offices and it was reported, or they were hospitalized. So we know that the burden of disease for both of these out in the community is probably much higher and we've had many more cases. These are folks who were just treating upper respiratory infections at home um, and weren't seeking medical care or diagnosis. So, the, so we still had a lot more cases circulating. And, and the cases are still, um, even though they're going down, they're still significant. So we really need to be diligent, especially with folks having resp upper respiratory infections. Um, make sure they stay at home, um, treat the symptoms, and then if they can't, make sure they get to their doctors or emergency rooms. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and RSV is, I mean, we, we get really scared with infants, right? Right, right, especially with infants who have some sort of underlying medical conditions, those are the ones that we are um, really concerned about because they are probably the most fragile. Um, some interesting things in the RSV world is that we have two vaccine manufacturers who are actually doing clinical trials on vaccines for the 65 plus age. Um, in fact, I'm such a vaccine zealot that even my husband is part of a clinical trial for one of the um, um, adult um, RSV vaccines, but we all know that by the time they get those um, licensed for adults, that they're going to move in really quickly to do safety trials and efficacy trials on children. So um, keep in mind that hopefully within the next five years, we might be immunizing um, kiddos against this disease if we're lucky. That's awesome. More vaccines are always a, a good thing um, in the long run. So <laughs> yes, I do understand that disease is bad. Vaccines vaccine. are good, as Dr. Yeah. Lewis always says. So. Exactly. And COVID is still here. COVID is still here. Um, and just keep remembering that flu started in 1918 and it's still here. So COVID will be with us for a long time. Um, we're just going to learn how to live with it and how we can manage it in vaccines and good old-fashioned public health, staying home when you're sick, covering your cough. Um, and again, I'm not going to say this, I'm going to say this a lot, getting vaccinated is how we're going to um, be able to live with COVID. Um, we um, did see a peak um, in early January, and it does look to be kind of hanging out and, and plateaued right now, mm -hmm. um, hoping that we don't go back to what it was in January of 22. Um, and as you can see, the cases are going down, um, but we still have COVID out there. Yeah, it's still out there and, and people are still dying of it. So we, I mean, I think we really do need to, re I think that it was, I looked at ADHS's data in the last few days and it had like 130, a little under 130 people had died in the last, I think, week of COVID in our state. So this is still a, a very real disease that's still devastating families. Right. And I think sometimes we get lulled into the fact that we're not seeing those incredibly high rates. Like you go back to November of 22, where those rates were so high, you start to say, well, we're out of the woods. Look how low those numbers are. But we mm -hmm. have people getting sick. We still have people getting hospitalized and we still have people dying. So I think we still need to be diligent. I can't even think of the word right now. We still need to diligent. Thank you. We still need to stay strong, and we need to make sure that we follow good old public health and get immunized. It is so important for. Uh, I mean, we talked a little bit, said how bad it was in the hospitals. I'm sure a lot of you have nurse friends and MA friends who work in hospitals. Mm -hmm. Um, or doctor friends who work in hospitals, it was bad. And they really need us to continue pushing these vaccines on that prevention end. Um, and, you, and you all see that the really highest numbers of all of these graphs we just showed were November, have the highest numbers of flu, RSV, and COVID. So um, that's pretty devastating to our hospital system when you have all of those sicknesses and illnesses. Yeah. And the more vaccines we get, the less likely people are in the arms, the less likely those people are to end up in the hospital. So um, are, vac are COVID and flu vaccines 100% effective? No, no, but we really want them because it's gonna make the, you know, how tough that, that sick is on your body a lot less and make you a lot less likely to end up in the hospital. Correct. 
Um, so these are some data on those hospitalizations the last right. 60 days. So yeah, and as you see, rates are better. going down. Yeah, yeah. rates are going down, they're going the right direction, but they're not zero. Um, so sometimes we get really excited and we celebrate the rates going down, which is really good for hospital staff and hospitals um, all together, but we're still seeing folks hospitalized. Um, right. So I'm gonna say it again, make sure everyone's vaccinated. Mm -hmm. So this is a little bit more COVID information. So on this left, this is a, a chart that we look at all the time. Um, and it shows the different variants um, that are in our community, you know, that are floating around Arizona. So that BA5, if you got sick in fall, um, that you probably had that BA5 strain, but you'll see that that's actually making up less of our cases. Um, and we, we have some different variants. The, the most popular one right now that's hitting all the news, popular in terms of what's in the news, is this XBB 1.5 um, Omicron mm -hmm. subvariant, which I'm sure that you've all heard heard of. It is in Arizona, yes. um, but it's not making up the masses yet. But this is a very transmissible form of COVID-19. The most that we've seen, good news is it's not as nasty. Bad news is it's very catchy. So curse on right. that. And again, the, the point is, is, is that if you've been vaccinated, you are going to have and it's um, less likely to get infected, less likely to get a severely ill. Yes. Yes. Um, but it's coming. We know that you've heard that. The other, yeah. before we get into guidance too around COVID, because um, I, it came up and I forgot to ask you about it. We're hearing, when you hear from patients, like, is the flu shot a good match? What are you saying? Well, okay, so first of all, we don't really know exactly if it's a good match until the end of the season, and we, we have all the isolates from folks, which means the lab samples and all of that. But what we're seeing is really good information. We are really seeing that right now preliminary, preliminary data shows that it's a really good match. Yeah. Um, and, and that is really good because um, this flu season would have been much worse or could be much worse yeah. uh, if it wasn't for that. But we are seeing preliminary data showing that it's a very good match. Yeah, I think it's important to remind our patient, your patients too, that you know, we don't know yet until all the until the end of the season, until everybody's gotten flu, because we don't have a denominator, right? So right. We, we don't know how many people got flu yet. So we don't know how and how many of those people got were immunized. And so you don't know until well after the flu season. But yeah, it's a good match. Even if it wasn't, you know what? I'd tell you to get it. So we always just want to push that flu vaccine. Yep. So, so CDC, but getting back to COVID, CDC talks has lots of different measures over the years that we've looked at for COVID. Um, the COVID community level, you wanna go over this with Karina? So our community level for COVID um, in Maricopa County is low and actually it's low throughout the state except for one county. Um, and so what they use is the case rate of COVID, the rate of new COVID-19 hospitalizations and the percentage of hospital beds that are occupied by a person with COVID. And so really, this is a really good measure on where are we, how, how resilient is our health, or how resilient, how can our healthcare system react to this? So right yeah, now- What kind of capacity do we what have? What kind of capacity do we have? So right now, because rates of COVID hospitalization emissions and the percentage is low, um, that puts us in a low rate community wise, which means that there really is no recommendation on wearing a mask at you know, Target or the movie theater or out in the community itself. Definitely, if you feel comfortable, I always recommend wearing a mask, but there's no recommendation right now because community wide, we are low. And this is where it gets a little confusing because- Well, let me see if everybody, oh, I have a couple prizes for the new year. So this is the map of Arizona. Tell us which state or which county in Arizona does not have a low rate. Somebody chatted in. So yellow is moderate, right? Oh, C Cassandra gets a Apache County. Up oh, and Darcy too. And those people all get the- Oh, and Lorraine did one too. So stay tuned, look at your chat box. Those of you who chatted in Apache County, uh, Laura, I'll contact you for your, your address for a price. Uh, so Apache County is not, is the only county in Arizona that is not in community levels that are low right now. So 
uh, but they're moderate. So they're still not, it's not high, which is, you know, still good. Right. And this is where it will get confusing because and why then, I said it was low, what's all the red about? So this is what makes it confusing. And this is community transmission for healthcare settings. And what they look at is the number of new cases per 100,000 in the last seven days and the percentage of positive in the last seven days. So currently, as far as healthcare settings go, we are considered high. And so what that actually means is that whenever you are in a healthcare setting or healthcare workers within a setting need to wear masks, that's the recommendation. Right. So if you go to your primary care, you should wear a mask to your primary care physician, medical assistants, nurses, front office staff, they should all be wearing masks. Yeah, sitting in your dental waiting room, you should have on you a, mask. Wear a mask. When you go to get your eyes examined, you should wear a mask. Um, visit your grandma in a long-term care facility wear a mask. So um, that's where it gets a little confusing. Yeah. So this is the number of COVID cases. So we still have a lot of COVID cases, which is why our transmission is high. Um, however, because our hospitals have a, enough capacity right now, which is, you know, to handle it, which is what's making it low. So, um, but all patient encounters you should have on a mask. It, it's kind of, I've been in a bunch of doctors, way too many doctor's appointments. Does I hate going to the doctors in January. Every time I'm sitting in a waiting room, I'm thinking, I, you know, I met my max out of pocket last year. I, this couldn't just hap have happened in December um, when it wouldn't have cost me more money. But um, but it seems like a lot of offices, special subspecialists is what I've been in, have, have these, like they got rid of their masking policies effective January 1st. It's just something that I've noticed with the, you know, very small number of offices I've gone into. But Really, all of our healthcare centers, if you're seeing patients, you should be having masks because we have a lot of COVID out there. Yes. Uh, and obviously the other stuff too. We know you don't make the policies in your office, but uh, feel free to share that if you'd like, that CDC's recommendation based on our community transmission levels is that you are masked in patient encounters right now. Um, okay, so now let's go over to vaccine updates. This is new since last time we met with this group and did a webinar. We have boosters for babies. So what's we have, with that? We have baby boosters. Yeah. Um, so the kiddos need to have their primary series um, and then they can receive their, their booster vaccine. Um, I know that it's a challenge because you use the monovalent for the primary and you have to use the booster vaccine for booster, but it is baby booster time. Um, so please, whatever you can do, just like any other vaccine, you're going to remind or recall and get them in for their boosters. Yeah. And we really, you know, for the other populations, a lot of people were able to receive their boosters. We're getting those reminder recalls from their pharmacy where they got it, or maybe from a, a community pod and then showing up in your office to complete their series. These babies own, you know, pretty much got the, only got their vaccines in your offices. They didn't go to pharmacies. They, there were some community events, but really we knew parents were gonna wanna talk to their child's uh, doctor or nurse practitioner about this vaccine. So we really need you to get these babies back in. Right, and again, these babies can't go to pharmacies. Because yes, they can't. They can't. So they need, to, um, they need to come to you for that. And because I believe that we're just so cold. Well, okay, we're cold here in Maricopa County. I know you all in places where there's a lot of snow are much colder, but us Maricopa County folks are sort of a little wimpy. And so we're all hunkering down together inside our um, homes with the heater set high. Um, and that's just where disease likes to spread and likes to travel. So yeah, make sure those babies get boosted. I do have some good news about that is that they are, the FDA is going to be meeting the end of this month to evaluate using the booster vaccine as a part of the primary series. Oh, cool. A lot of you who are, who may have, our county health staff may have heard this last week as well. Um, so if we're lucky, they will get rid of the monovalent vaccine and we will be using that booster dose vaccine for both the primary series and the booster dose, which I know should make life easier for everyone in the office. I know it's gonna make life much easier for us. Great. Because I compare um, COVID vaccine and the, the instruction sheets, much like trying to um, trying to set your VCR to record. 
Now, I don't know who out there is old enough to know a VCR. But that's was, a you beat me to it. What's a VCR, she says. Uh, the other thing that's new is we have, and a lot of people don't know because the news of this broke um, when you had RSV, COVID, and flu in record numbers in your waiting room. So uh, you can log on to ACES and start ordering single dose vials now. Um, these are bivalent Pfizer COVID vaccines for ages 12 and older. Um, storage and handling is the same. You know, it's not, if you are an office who hasn't yet offer, started ordering COVID vaccine and offering it because you were worried that you would waste a hundred, you know, you wouldn't use that many. Um, storage and handling has changed quite a bit. So if you're not yet offering COVID and you're wondering what are the requirements, please let us know. Um, we'll walk you through all of that. Um, the single dose, vi the minimum order quantity is 50 right now. So you have to order 50 of those doses. Um, you order those directly through ACES. They don't come with the ancillary kit supplies. So you have to get your own needles and band-aids and um, swabs and all of those things. Um, and th these are not meant to replace multi-dose vials. So if you are already ordering multi-dose vials, um, continue doing that. Uh, this is just for those folks who were really didn't knew that there was no way they were going to be able to get through a hundred of the a hundred doses. And the NDC code is on the slide for those. Right there. Yeah. Um, anything else on this, Macrina? No, I think too. What's going to make it easier is again pay attention to what the FDA and the ACIP says about about getting rid of the monovalent and being able to use the. Um, bivalent for both the primary series because mm -hmm. that should also make your life much easier. Yeah. Um, and I do recognize that sometimes single dose vials use more space in the refrigerator. Um, I totally understand that. Yeah. Um, but again, 50 doses, um, I, I think it's, it's somewhat manageable, a little bit more manageable. Yeah, we'd love to hear if there's anybody who's on the line who hasn't yet offered COVID vaccine to their patients because um, of the quantity that you had to order before. And we'd love to just hear from you about whether this is helpful or not. Um, um, we're just, we're starting to call offices now that you're getting a little bit more normal winter traffic uh, to make sure that people are aware of this. So we just, we'd love to hear any feedback that you have just so we can collect information about it, but hopefully this will be um, easier, easier ways to get COVID vaccine in offices, right? More ways to get COVID. It's definitely going to be easier because I think we're just so used to single dose vials now. So I think this will be much easier. Yeah. So Tori's saying the barrier is Pfizer is requiring 300 doses. So this might be a great thing for you because now you only have to order in 50 dose increments for those single dose vials on ACES. Um, and, and yes, the Jessica is saying the CDC's mantra uh, for COVID vaccine is do not waste an arm. Um, so there, anything that you don't get to use would not hit your report cards or anything like that. For these single dose files, the ADHS is urging you to not waste doses because they're hoping with this smaller increment, you don't have to. That's certainly what everyone recommends. You can Always, if you know something's going to expire soon, you can use that vaccine matchmaker app to try and find another provider. Uh, but overall, don't waste an arm. Any COVID vaccine in an arm is a good thing. Uh, right. Storage is a barrier for we care. Yeah, for those 100 dose vials, it, the, for the 100 dose ones, it's small. Like it's a. Um, They're very tiny. Yeah, it's smaller, but the very 50 tiny. dose will be more. Yeah, and again, for the primary series, we're still using the monovalent. So you still have to have both monovalent and bivalent on, on hold. And the um, primary series monovalent is still the multi-dose file. Uh, yeah. But but just, just well, I'm, I'm sure that Tabby and ADHS and everyone will send out information once we get, um, once the FDA meets um, the end of this month and ACIP chimes in. Um, things may be getting a lot easier for us and we're moving more into normal yeah as COVID vaccines go um Jen Tinney are you on because we have a billing question in the chat too is she on today let me see 
She is not, but I will get her right now. <laughs> okay, yeah. Well, make sure you get her before the end of the hour. How about that? Okay. She can answer it in the chat. And Brenda, we'll make sure to get that to you in the chat today. And I'll be sure to say out loud when we get it. Um, the get We know how we're so appreciative that you're spending the extra time with families right now to talk to them about flu vaccine and COVID vaccine because um, they're both just such so important. We know that this is like, gotten harder um it's not that i don't think that there's i hoped i like to think half glass full right it's not that there's more vaccine total resistant parents it's just that we've heard a lot about vaccines over the last few years and parents have a lot more questions and that means you are having to spend a lot more time answering those questions and um, just remember every parent that's asking a question is not trying to make your day even worse. They're not all going to tell you that there's microchips in these vaccines. Uh, they just have questions and, and are looking to you to help answer them and direct their, them to their provider if you can't answer those questions. But here's a couple tips about uh, things to know for COVID vaccines specifically. Yeah, I think that, that the good thing is that because of COVID vaccines, I think a lot of families and adults and people who weren't involved in vaccines actually understand the process from sciences saying, hey, this is what we can do to actually getting it into an arm. The problem is they also know that information now. And so they, they want to ask, they want more questions answered. Um, but again, I think the things to really remember is that the COVID vaccine is safe. Um, it, it passed all the safety trials just because it's still under an emergency use authorization, it's not meaning it's not safe to use. It is effective. Again, is it perfect? No, but will it protect your child from hospitalization? Yes, in most cases. Um, getting vaccinated can help protect children against COVID-19. It's gonna protect their, um, the kiddos that they play with against COVID-19. It's gonna protect you and it's gonna protect their parents and their, grand and their grandparents. Um, it really is about that herd immunity and protecting everyone. Um, yes, yeah, some children may have some normal possible side effects to the vaccine, but that's perfectly normal. That's just your body building an immune response. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when I was a kid, my grandma would always ask my mom, did, you know, did she get a fever? Did she have a sore arm? Was there something going on? Because if there was, that means it took good, according to my grandmother. So it means your body is building an immune response. It's doing what it's supposed to do. Um, children receive a much smaller dose than adults. Um, so we're not. We're not putting too much vaccine in them. Um, if they've had COVID-19 or you don't know whether they've had COVID-19, they still should get vaccinated. Um, and I think the most important thing for parents to understand is that they can receive all the vaccines together safely. Um, there's no reason to wait in between other vaccines and COVID vaccines. They can all be administered at the same time on the same day. Um, and I just would start talking about COVID-19 vaccine, just like we talk about all the other vaccines and how they're just part of our routine childhood immunization schedule. Um, and I think that is, is really gonna be helpful to parents. And I'm sharing stories about, you know, letting folks know, you know what, well, I have a lot of parents who immunize their kids with, vaccine, with the COVID-19 vaccine. I think sharing that information is helpful too. Um, and I think now might be the time to talk about it because we have a lot of parents who kind of want to wait. They want to see what's happening. And I think sharing your personal stories about you've immunized a lot of kids and everything's been okay is, is okay and helpful. Yes. Um, the other, children are getting vaccinated for the first time every, every day. So when you're having, for COVID vaccine, you know, for against COVID-19, so when you're having these conversations and your families don't say yes right there, uh, they are saying yes the next time that Macrina's team shows up with their mobile van at their church or the next time that um, the school hosts a vaccine event and offers COVID vaccine. So these discussions are going to continue to stay really important, recommend them just the same way that you recommend your flu vaccine. Um, and I think it's gonna feel kind of the same way probably for a few years as you know the same struggle they have with flu, so. Um, anybody have other questions? We're digging out the... Um, uh, there we go. We're looking through chat. 
Anybody have other questions? All righty. Um, well, we're going to transition over to our friends at ADHS. And why did we invite them? Well, there's these things we do every year, and they are called the Daniel T. Cloud Awards. So if you've been around vaccines or primary care for a long time, you are very familiar with these awards, which recognize um, one of our founders, Dr. Cloud, who was a neonatologist in, in Arizona and coined the phrase, I don't remember, 90,000 babies uh, are born a year in Arizona, none of them arrive immunized. And these awards recognize his legacy and they highlight uh, practices who are able to receive 90% immunization coverage for their toddlers. Uh, so for that two year visit and or uh, practices that can show 90% coverage of their teen rates. And there's, there's um, two steps, nominations for the Cloud Awards are gonna open on January 25th. And we'll go over the deadline again um, in a little bit, but there's two steps to doing this. The first thing you're gonna do is nominate your practice. If you think that you've, you are close to that 90% coverage, you think that you really do a, a rock star job getting your entire population of kids immunized, nominate yourselves, uh, then you will submit your reports. So if you don't have the 90% coverage yet, uh, then you'll be able to go back and do some things to get patients back in, clean up your data and uh, and be able to show that you do in fact have 90% coverage. Uh, and then you are invited to this great reception that we're having at the Mesa Convention Center this the first night, I think, of the State Immunization Conference, and we will recognize your practice. So um, I am going to turn stop sharing my screen here and actually introduce Eileen, and you can share your screen, um, and she's going to talk to us about the reporting part. And I, oh, there you are. Here I am. Let's see. Okay, can you guys yep. see it fine? We see it great. Okay, perfect. So I'm Eileen, I'm with the ADHS program. I am going to go over how to run your own coverage rate reports to see how your clinic is doing on your current rates. And that way you can see kind of, of where you're starting and then work on how to improve them. So first we'll go over the coverage rate. You would log into ACES. On the left-hand menu in ACES, you would go to reports, select report module, then a bunch of reports will come up. You will go ahead and select coverage rate report. Once that you have selected that, a window with this information will pop up. You will go ahead and run your report by ownership. That way it runs a report by all the patients that your practice currently owns. Then you will decide on which series you want to run. For example, you are able to run it for toddlers and the series would be 4313314. What that means is you're running the report to for all these vaccines, for the all four DTAPs, all three polios, their first MMR, their three hep Bs, their three hips, their first varicella, and all four pneumococcals. And then, or if you want to run it for adolescents, you can go ahead and select this series, which is one Tdap, one MCV, and up-to-date HPV. This captures the two dose series for HPVs or patients that have needed to get the three dose series as well. After you decide the series, you will go ahead and select the age range that you're wanting to run it for. For example, for toddlers, you, I would recommend for you to run it for the 24 months old to 35 months old. Or if you're running for adolescents, it would be 13 year olds. And I believe for Tappy, it's 15 year olds, uh, 13 to 15. Is that correct? It's only 15 years of age. So they would oh. enter 15 to 15. 
at 15 to 15. Okay, perfect. So for the tab B award, you would select 15 to 15. Then um, you are able to create the coverage rate report, which will give you the number and percentages of the patients. Or you can go ahead and create a patient list, will, which will give you a list of all the patients in the report, and you'll be able to decipher which patients are currently missing what doses and what dose. And here I have an example of running the coverage rate report for toddlers. So as mentioned before, you would go ahead and run by ownership. You would select the series. We're running for toddlers here. Then you would select the age range, which would be 24 months to 35 months. You would select here, evaluate at age 24. And then down here, this will show the report columns that you're gonna have on your report and you would select complete by vaccine, incomplete series, not yet due, not yet due late by age and missed opportunities. Then you would create coverage report and this is how your report would look like. So here it shows us the number of patients in the assessment. Here it shows us the number and percentages of the patients complete by vaccines. Then here on incomplete series, it's showing us the number and percentages of patients missing immunizations in ACEs. Not yet due is showing us, uh, again, the number and percentages of patients up to date by 24 months of age. Not yet due late by age is showing us the number and percentages of patients that are up to date, but after 24 months of age. Then here is our missed opportunities, uh, the number and percentages of patients missed opportunities to vaccinate. And this is your series completion. So the number and percentages of patients that have completed through 35 months of age. So have gotten all of these required vaccines. Then here we're running it for adolescents. So we are running it by ownership. We're selecting the series for adolescents, one Tdap, one MCV, and up-to-date HPV. We're selecting the age range. Then you would select the columns to show on the coverage rate. You would select complete vaccine by, incomplete series, and missed opportunities. Then you would create the report. And this is what the coverage rate report would look like and the same total of patients in the um, specified age group, the number and percentages of the complete by vaccine, incomplete series, the, the number and percentages, missed opportunities, and the completion series. So all the patients that have gotten all of these three vaccines and have completed the HPV series. This number tends to be a bit lower, unfortunately, because HPV is more of a recommended and not required for, for school. So some families tend to not want this vaccine. That why, that's why this number tends to be a bit lower. Then if you're wanting to know exactly all these patients that you're running and you wanna know which patients are missing which doses, you would run your coverage rate report patient list. So again, you would do the same as if you're running the report for both toddlers and adolescents, but on the bottom, instead of creating the report, you would create patient list or export the patient list, which will create it into a Excel spreadsheet. And make sure to include exclude patients who have either no forecast or have aged out of the vaccines. And then this is how your patient list would look like. So here we have the patient's demographics. Here it's showing us the vaccines the patient is missing and the dose number that the patient's missing. 
Also here would be the recommended date of when they're due for that vaccine and the minimum date. You will notice sometimes that there are some patients that show up in blue. That means that they will be due for that vaccine soon, so they're not quite yet past due on it. And then just a reminder, if you ever have a patient that's no longer receiving services in your clinic, then remember just to go into ACEs and inactivate those patients. That way they're not counting against your coverage rate report. Any questions? Okay, so then our next report to try and increase these, uh, your coverage rate numbers, what we would recommend is running reminder recall reports. So with this, the same, you would log into your ACES account. On the left-hand side of the ACES, you would go into the tab reminder recall, select reminder recall, and a page like this would pop up. Then in the following slides, I'm going to go over each section of what needs to be inputted to run the reminder recalls. So the first section, how do you want to run this reminder recall? So first, you will make sure where it'll automatically default to all your the patients that you own. Just make sure you don't uncl unclick it. Then you will decide the time frame you want to run. So do you want to run only for patients that are currently due, patients that are past due, or patients that are upcoming due for vaccines? So you will decide on the time frame you want to run it, and then you can go ahead and select all active for these because we want to make sure you're searching for all your active patients, or also if you leave it blank, it'll default to all active patients. Then on the second section, once you have selected the time frame, you will go ahead and select up here. It'll give your clinics information. Here you will decide if you want to run the report by patient age range or by birth date. Me personally, I think patient age range is a lot easier than trying to calculate the birth dates that you want to run. If you run it by age, uh, age range, you will select the ages. So here we're running it by 24 months, then 35, and you would select here the months. If you're doing adolescence, it would be the same. You have to select um, if you want to run it by age range or birth date, then you will select here age 11 years to 18 years. It'll give you a list of all those patients that are due for vaccines. My recommendation would be focus on one age group at a time. That way you're not overwhelmed with a list full of patients. Just focus maybe on your 11 years old that are coming due for the Tdap, their MCV and their HPV, or uh, for four-year-olds that are do or coming up do for their kindergarten vaccines, but it's your choice. You can go ahead and customize it the way you want to run it or to your clinic's needs. Then we would go to the second set of the third section, which vaccines would you like to include? So here we're running it by the all of these vaccines. So we're using the 4313314 again which includes all of these vaccines and the number of doses. Or if we're wanting to run it for adolescents, we would select the one Tdap, one MCV, and up-to-date HPV. And these are the doses here. I know it says three, but it does include also patients who are up-to-date with only two dose series. And then we would make sure do for all selected vaccines, and then you would generate the patient list. You can, if you don't want to run this, um, these two series, you can go ahead and also customize it. By customizing, you would select which vaccines you want to run it by, and the dose number for each vaccine. 
And again, you would do, do for all selected vaccines and you would generate patient lists if, if you wanna customize your own reminder recall report. If you are trying to run it for your men B vaccines, again, you would also need to customize it. Don't mind the misspelling on this slide, please. Um, so depending on which men B vaccine you have in your clinic, it would um, you would decide on which one you need. So it's either um, it would be either the Bexero or the Trumemba. You would decide on those two, or maybe you have both on in your clinic. You would select both to do the reminders. And again, but you would also want to change the uh, age range when running this report for uh, men B to 16 to 18 years old. Because sometimes, according, depending on risk factors, they can get it younger, but it's up to the doctor's discretion. But routinely, it's given to 16 year olds and older. And then once you create the generate the patient list. For men B, this is what your recall report would look like. So technically anybody, it'll show here that they're due for both because technically it really depends on what your clinic is offering. So just wanted to give you the guys that heads up right here. And then or the other types of reports. So once you're running for like the routine toddlers and adolescent reports, you will, once you generate the report, the list, it'll pop this window up, which gives you patients demographics, available contact methods. And if you see a patient in this list that no longer is getting service at your clinic, you can also inactivate them here. Once you have this, you will go ahead and submit. And this window will pop up where you will generate a patient list. Now here, this up here shows you the number of patients, the addresses on file for those patients, phone numbers, um, cell phone numbers, and emails on address in ACES. Once you select a patient list to create your recall report, this window will pop up. You will go ahead and just run the report. And this is how your report will look like. So here we have the vaccines you're running the report for, the total of patients selected, and here would be the vaccines the patients do for, the dose number, and the recommended day and minimum date. That, and this is what your top adolescent report, reminder recall report would look like. And the same, the vaccines you're running it for, the total number of patients, patients demographics, the vaccines patient is due for, dose number, recommended date and minimum date, and also on the adolescent report, it will check for that second um, MCV. And it'll also check for the Tdap booster. If they're due for one, it would also, um, on the dose number, it'll have a B saying that it, they're due for their booster. Any questions so far on the reminder recall report? There was just a couple of clarifications, Eileen, in the in the chat. Well, one is that we will be sending you all of these links and they'll be posted on our website, but the links are on there for uh, the slides and the screenshots that Eileen's showing. So um, one question was if the patients refuse vaccines, does that and that's going to affect your percentage, um, what is the best thing to do? Should we inactivate? And uh, we're not looking for perfect for Cloud Awards. So 90% is not perfect. Um, it's very hard to achieve. 
But the patients who refuse are counted in that denominator. They are your patients, um, but that's why we're not looking for 100%. So that denominator will include patients who refuse, patients who have medical exemptions or other reasons why they're not able to get those vaccines. So we don't think you should inactivate those. We still, especially for your refusals, um, we still want those reminders to go to families that they need vaccines when you run those reports. Uh, your office is still going to be documenting those refer refusals at each visit. So um, so it is in there. Um, the other classification or clarification is that the assessment for the teen award should be run. It should be age 13 to 15. And uh, Jen says that gives practices a year to complete the 11 to 12 year old series and measures a larger cohort from 13 to 15. Um, and it says, are your reports running slow? Yeah. So they can run slow depending on the time of the day and how many people are running it. And also if they're slow, it can also mean that it's also the amount of patients that you, the report is trying to generate from. So if it's a big practice, it might take longer to run that report. All righty. So let's talk about um, how to inactivate patients in ACEs. So this one's an easy one. So we only want you to inactivate patients, only patients that are not receiving services in your practice any longer. So you would do the same, log into ACEs. You would search the patient as you would normally search any patient when you're looking up vaccines. You would have first and last name, date of birth, select the patient. Once that patient's uh, chart opens up, it'll bring you to the demographics page. Once you're in that demographics page, you will go ahead and edit. And then here on patient's demographic edits, you will go ahead and change the organization level from active to inactive or disease, deceased if applicable. Once that's been selected, you will go ahead and save it. And this is how it should look like in organization level once that patient has been inactivated. And that is my end. You guys have any questions, put them in the chat and I'll be gladly answering those. And I see there's that question about including, Jen, are you able to speak to that question in the chat about why are we including patients that aren't yet due? Yeah, I'm actually typing it out right now, but oh, cool. the, the cloud assessments actually do just measure the vaccines that are already due. So for the toddlers, it measures the series that should be completed by age 24 months. So we're looking at that 24 month point to see if they've been covered by then. And the teens measure age 13 to 15, and that teen series should have been completed at by age 12 in that range. So it is measuring what's already been due. And I'll also type it out. Thank you. Anybody else have questions? All right, well, Eileen and Rose, thank you so much uh, for going over that. Remember that nominations for this are going to open January 25th. So the first time, the first step is to nominate your practice. Um, and remember, anybody can nominate any practice. So you can also nominate where you receive care, your family practice, um, if you would like to. Um, or maybe one of your patients would nominate you. But the first step is to nominate yourself. Then you'll be able to submit uh, these reports. So um, a couple states that we'd love you to save. Uh, are, we are so glad to have a face-to-face -face, live and in-person immunization conference again this year. That is scheduled for April 19th and 20th. It's at the Mesa Convention Center. Uh, and the evening of the 19th 
is when we are going to host our reception um, from Tappy Best Practices and Brightest Stars Award Ceremony. Uh, this is where all of the cloud award awards will be presented. Um, it, if you have not gone to this or you're new to vaccines, it's really a fun event. Uh, and it is a celebration of our medical assistants and our nurses and the people who really uh, the immunization delivery system is on your backs. You're the ones running these reports, uh, making sure that those reminder recalls get sent in, identifying patients that really need to have a little bit of extra time and attention with their MA or with their nurse or maybe with their provider so that they can make the best decision about vaccines for their families. And it's really a really fun event. So um, we're really excited to do both of these live and in person and together. We've never done it, um, our TAPI event at the Mesa Convention Center. So we are also excited uh, to have a new, a new space and there's gonna be a lot of special activities uh, with this conference. Uh, the nominations for clouds will open on January 25th. The other thing that we will do at our event um, on April 19th is nominate the big shots uh, or have present our big shots of Arizona awards. These are for community members, businesses who really have gone above and beyond to promote vaccines. So in the past, we've had school nurses get this award. We've had VFC coordinators get this award who've been nominated by the other MAs in their practice for really doing outstanding work. Um, maybe you didn't get a cloud award, maybe you don't have 90% coverage, but you really made a huge improvement in that award. Or maybe you did some special events or unique partnerships to promote flu vaccine or COVID vaccines or get Tdap vaccines into pregnant moms. So they, they're they really, the Big Shot Awards are the full gamut. Um, we've had members of the media get Big Shot Awards. Um, representatives from churches, uh, you know, really it's just to highlight anyone in our community who promotes vaccines. So start thinking about who you might be able to uh, nominate from your, um, from your community. Another date we'd love for you to save is February 2nd. Uh, this event is going to be 10 things parents need to know about why we immunize. This gives you some really great tips to have those difficult conversations with your patient's families and with your sister um, or your cousin who just had a baby, like I have one in my family, and really just tips about how to, how to talk about vaccines to those families. If you have new MAs, well, if you have new MAs, keep them because everyone else on this call is looking for more MAs. But if you have new MAs, this is a really great way to ask your practice manager to let those new MAs spend an hour and a half. This, it's really a really great session. Uh, and that's going to be February 2nd. It's really geared towards anyone who talks about vaccines, but like regular people, like community health workers, or maybe um, someone new to your nursing team or your MA team who hasn't talked about these vaccines in a while because they're coming from, you know, kidney dialysis or something else. Another date to save is that a similar session, uh, 10 Things ses session, is going to be hosted a week later on February 9th. That's geared towards school nurses and our health office staff. And we are really happy to announce that our tips, our training for immunization practices series uh, that we have done, boy, for a really, really long time, is going live again. Uh, coming to a community near you, we are starting the planning process to travel the summer around Arizona and offer these in-person sessions when things are a little bit slower in your offices. And we absolutely can't wait to tell you where we're going, uh, when we're going to be there, uh, those dates will be finalized in the next few months. And we just can't wait to be in a room uh, physically with all of you again. Huh, Macrina? Oh, I just cannot wait. Yeah. The other thing that's great is we get to leave Phoenix, which is the worst place on the planet in the summer. So we can't wait to, <laughs> to get up north. Um, or, you know, hopefully, you know, get up north or to the Chiricahua Mountains or wherever we end up this year. So anywhere almost is cooler than Phoenix. So um, and we will keep the line open for just a few more minutes in case anybody has other questions um, or anything that you have on your mind. Um, but otherwise, 
We hope to see you at 10 things in February and stay tuned to your inbox for any new webinars. When something changes, we'll pull something together again. So um, rest assured, we'll have some sort of change to vaccines in the next quarter. So. I haven't gotten any wacky questions today, Macrina. Did you get wacky questions today? None. Got none. I know. I guess they're saving them all for February, huh? <laughs> for or maybe they're just saving all of them until we get there live in person. Yeah. It's much more fun to stump Macrina live in person. I know. And then you get to throw the prizes at people. Oh, that's really much more fun than mailing them too. Yeah. Yeah, I guess we need to get together to talk about tips soon. Oh, good. Yeah. Yeah, it'll be good to be at the conference again, too, huh? We will see you all there. All right, I don't think we have wacky questions. I think we're ready to log off. Good. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. Have a great week.